Okay, right, well, looks like everything's working here, that's good. We've been enjoying the uh, cool weather in the mornings and uh, in the evenings too, at times, and uh, enjoying our walks as usual, eating our persimmons. <laughs> of course, you hit the wrong one, man. Your mouth's not quite right for a couple hours after that. Uh, but anyway, they are, they are nice. I like them, actually, when you get them right. There's a beautiful tree we go past on Thunderbird, and it is literally laden. It is just packed with them. Of course, all the best ones are right up the top, and everyone's sort of getting the ones nearby, but the ones that you really want to get up are up high, which reminds me of my days when I was a, uh, a young man going to university, had to make some money in the orchard, and the uh, guy in charge of the orchard, he often would make me climb to the top of the trees to get the last of the fruits, which were the best ones. And he would reward me by saying, well, Wayne, uh, you can take the biggest of them and you, you can eat that. You know. And so the, the, after just about killing myself, getting to the top, uh, I would uh, be rewarded by having maybe the biggest peach. And if you've ever seen some of the fruit that's left at the top of the, these fruit trees, they are amazing things. They'll be very colorful and heavy and uh, sweet. Very nice. And I used to sit down uh, underneath the tree on a hot day, peach tree, and consume this massive peach, which was just full of juice, you know, just all sugar, really. That's all it was. Sack full of sugar. So, yeah, those memories come back. And uh, so we're enjoying ourselves. I'm also enjoying baking. I've been making some bread, wholemeal bread or mixture of wholemeal and white mixed together and having fun watching it rise, you know, and of course, you're, who's it going to rise this time? Yeah, you go, boom, up it goes into the oven, out it comes, that smell of fresh bread. Oh, man, I think I'll be, I'll be putting on some pounds if I keep this up, man, because uh, when it's hot and you put on a slap of butter, oh, man. That thing is dangerous. Anyway, let's pray. Our God and Father, we thank Thee for this time that we have, Lord, together. And we thank Thee for the life we have, all the enjoyments of life. And we thank Thee for it and also for the future, Lord. We are so thankful that we have this bright, beautiful future to look forward to. And we thank Thee in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, right. Well, up here I've got the usual slides. So we'll jump through them because we, we know about all this stuff here, you know, all the books and stuff. And of course, I'm making, I'm making cut and paste from Welsh's Life Through His Name. And so here we are, finally, finally, today, we're right down here on the eighth sign, which corresponds to the first. So this, this wonderful introversion that occurs uh, with the structure. Now, the fact that the structure occurs and is quite Evidently there. It's not a matter of, uh, well, I'm going to argue that there's a structure in the Bible. There is a structure in the Bible. It's not, a, it's not a matter of my interpretation. It's simply a literary structure that exists. And uh, you can just see it for yourself. The fact that it exists, though, is one of the great pointers, I think, to the inspiration of the Scriptures. And so this one here, A, the marriage in Cana, the third day, no wine, glory manifest and then down here the draft of fishes the third time no meat lord manifested a wonderful correspondence comes up here which i'm going to look further into now if you look at this there is if you go to where the eighth sign is let's do it let's go to john okay so in, in, in john chapter number 21 i've learned a lot here folks this last passage Eye opener, another one of these big eye openers for me personally, and it's going to feed into my understanding of what's going on at this age. So this this is a very significant portion. So the first thing, if you, if you notice, chapter twenty one, after the, verse one, after these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples. Showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and on this wise showed he 
himself. There is this manifestation that's occurring now by the Lord Jesus after his resurrection. Now, remember, this resurrection is not like the resurrection that Lazarus partook of. Lazarus was brought back to life. Yes, that's a resurrection. But there are different classes of resurrection. The, the resurrection that the Lord took was unto eternal life, a body that would not die. Now, he had previously a body that would die, and what's the proof that it would die? It died! It died. That's the evidence that it could die. It died. And he was resurrected to new life with this new immortal body. And then he's showing himself, okay, and at the Sea of Tiberias. Now, the eighth sign begins here in this first verse. And it goes right across to verse 14. Just look at it. It says, this is now, verse 14, this is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after that he was risen from the dead. Very, very important. You see this third time. There's lots of timing issues that's going on here. Third time. This manifestation. And that's the eighth sign. And I'm just trying to show you that the order of things in this last chapter. Then what happens is from verse 15 to 19, what you get in here is these questions and commands from Jesus to Peter. And they're very marked, and I'll be honest with you, for a long time I've had problems with this, understanding this, because it seems very strange how you have this. And what happens is, if you look at verse 15, so when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas. Ah, stop. Son of Jonas. Now, Jonas, if you know about Jonah, he was the prophet of rebellion. And he would not take his instructions to go to the Gentiles. No, don't want to do that. They're our enemies. So he had to have an encounter with a fish. Right? Big time encounter with a fish. In fact, he went to hell. Now, it says, Son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? More than these. What's he qualifying then? It's a love. It's the love that's the issue here. Oh, well, go back. Okay, the issue here is love. Because he says here, Lovest thou me more than these here? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. Feed my lambs. Now, if you watch this, and we're going to have to dig up the Greek. It's coming on, okay? I'm just pointing this out at the beginning because I probably won't quite get there. So let me talk about the structure of what we're going to do here, right? Because this is just too much stuff in here for me. There's too much material to get all this in one shot. So this is what I'm proposing. Today what I'll do is I'll try and get the, um, the eighth sign, right? We'll try and hit that. But then what happens is you get some very interesting things happen, especially to Peter. Now, the eighth sign does involve Peter too. In fact, the whole of chapter number 21 is Peter-centric. There's a lot to do with Peter in here. And you might say, hmm, that's interesting. Why? Why is Peter being looked at in chapter 21? Okay, so that's a question. What's this all about, Peter? Because that's, that's a big, big time topic here. So you've got the eighth sign. What I'm going to do is I'm going to address the eighth sign today. And then we come back next Sunday. What I want to do is I want to give a synopsis of what I've learned and what it means. What does John mean to us in this age? And I want to give you like a synopsis of that. That's going to happen next week. But this week I want to concentrate on the eighth sign. And maybe we can get into some of these other issues as well. 
Let's see how far we go. But the issue about Peter is really important. So you notice here in chapter 21, verses 20 to 24, goes on Peter, Jesus, and John. And then there's that last verse of summary. So I just want you to see the structure of this. Now go back here. Let me just, uh, I might show this. Um, if you go back to ch chapter 20 and verse and number 31. Okay, so chapter 20 and verse 31. Just look at how it ends. We've read this before, but I want to point this out. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. If you follow verse 30 and 31, you can see this comes to a natural end. The, the book appears to come to a very natural end. You have the Lord has been resurrected. You have this great confession of Thomas. And then you get this kind of finalist statement. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. A natural end comes. And it's after the seventh sign. Jesus has re been resurrected. But what happens is... There is this sudden, wait a minute. So you get a natural ending, and then you get like a PS. You say, does this happen anywhere else? Yeah, you can find it in Philippians. There's two endings in Philippians. You can find three endings in Romans. So there's this idea that something comes to an end, a natural end, but then there is an, an important afterthought. And perhaps an afterthought thought to that, where things are added on the end. And it's not as if it's haphazard, it's deliberate. It's there for emphasis. Now, if you look what happened in, for example, John, uh, let's go across a little bit here, John 18. All right, and um, there, of course, in John 18, you've got some tremendous things here, but one of the bad things that happens is this handing off of the Lord Jesus Christ going from Annas to Caiaphas and then from Caiaphas to Pilate. And it says this um, in verse 15. This is chapter 18, 15. And Simon Peter followed Jesus and so did an another, another disciple. That disciple was known under the high priest. Oh, that's interesting. So here we've got someone that was known to the high priest and went in with Jesus into the palace of the high priest. So because he was known by the high priest, he gained access to the headquarters of the high priest. He could go in. Jesus was taken in because he was a prisoner. But now this other disciple had entry in because he knew the high priest. And verse 16, now look what it says. But Peter stood at the door without. He couldn't go in. Then went out that other disciple... So he was in, and then he comes out the door, which was known unto the high priest, and spake unto her that kept the door. There was a woman there, a damsel we will read about, who kept the door. That was her job, to maintain that door and only let in people who were supposed to be in. And then it says, and spake unto her that kept the door. Okay, so this disciple, who was known to the high priest, spoke to the damsels that just let him come in. He can come in. And brought in Peter. So Peter comes in. Now look what happens. Now it doesn't say this, but you could imagine it happening, right? Peter comes through the door. And as he goes past the door, the damsel holding the door, the damsel looks at him and slips a remark. Then saith the damsel that kept the door unto Peter. Art not thou also one of the, this man's disciples? He saith, I am not. Denial. Here it is. The first denial, right? Peter, now denying that he is a disciple. And you can read the account. I want to you can get it yourself. But if you, as you read further in, look what it says in verse 24. Now, An Annas had sent him bound unto Caiaphas, the high priest. And Simon Peter stood and warmed himself. Okay, he stood and warmed himself. 
Okay, that's all right. You need some warmth. They said therefore unto him, Art not thou also one of his disciples? He denied it and said, I am not second denial. One of the servants of the high priest, being his kinsman, whose ear Peter cut off. Remember that account? Malchus he cut his ear off. Wham! Very impetuous man, this guy. He's quick on the draw. And he, the, the, his Smith and Wesson was a sword. Wham! Off comes the ear. Peter cut off. Saith, did not I see thee in the garden with him? Peter then denied again and immediately the cock crew. Okay, there it goes. Three times. Three times. Oh, wait a minute now. Do you remember what we just pointed out in chapter 21 when it has to do with Peter? It, when you come to the accounts in verses 15 to 19, you get three times. Peter, do you love me? Three times. Three how many times did Peter deny him? Three times. Here is a reaffirmation of Peter's state. Right? Do you love me? Previously, three denials. Now, the Lord is bringing this back to him. Right? And affirms it. And at the end of this, he says, Feed my lamb, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. And it says this in verse 17, it says, um, He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, feed my sheep. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, now here's a prophecy of the Lord, Thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This, verse 19, look at the interpretation. This spake he signifying by what death he should glorify God. This is a prophecy. Yes, the Lord accepts his statement and shows now, yes, you're going to go all the way. You're going to be faithful to the end. Right? And I see in this a, a tremendous thing. So, jo John chapter 21 is like a PS. And what he's going to do, the writer, Peter, uh, writer John is going to talk about Peter and show what happened to Peter. And show his state. That's one of the functions, this, this addition that goes after the end. You have an ending after the ending. And the ending is like a postscript where John shows what's going to happen. But furthermore... Do you notice the symmetry of this thing? So if you go to the end of John 20, what you've got is you've got the statement of Thomas, my Lord and my God, right? My Lord and my God. The Lord of me, literally, the Lord of me and the God of me. That's what it means. Thomas, right? And then... You, you get this wonderful statement right near the end. And then in chapter 21, what happens is John takes up this issue to do with Peter in, in many ways and, and fixes up our knowledge of, and, and what happened to Peter and, and what, is, what happened to the ministry of Peter, right? Uh, that fixes that up about Peter. But here's another thing that happens. Over here, you've got the seventh sign, all right? You have the seventh sign, and you have then the Lord is raised. He's brought to life. Now, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven signs. And then, what is the eighth? Well, the eighth is always a new beginning, isn't it? You have seven days, and then you have the eighth as a new beginning. Chapter 21 is, is, is the new beginning, you see. <laughs> you have the completion. You have an ending. There is an ending there. But there's also a PS that goes on the end which relates to this new beginning. Now, the sign, the sign which has to do with the draft of fishes is now right in the, 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 the new beginning section of, of John's Gospel. 
And uh, so if I just go back a little bit here, you notice that in the account, if you look at John 21, um, let's see, uh, it says this in verse 11, Simon Peter went up and drew the, the net to, to land, this is John 21, 11, full of great fishes in 150 and 3, 153. And for all there were so many, yet was not the net broken. You've got fishes, you've got the net, you've got 153. Okay? Now, an interesting thing. Bullinger was big on numbers. And what he shows is if you look at the, um, the, the, word, the Hebrew words, Beni Ha Elohim, the sons of God, you find the number is 153. If you look at Ichthuis and the net, Dictuon, they're both 1,224, which is eight 153s. The 153, therefore, seems to be in the context of fulfilled blessings. Multiply blessings through the Son of God. A completeness in blessings. Just putting this out. Now, I don't think this number, you know, like the number obviously means something, right? And the Bible doesn't come out straight and tell us what it means. So how are we going to know what it means? Well, we've only got the context. We've got some gematria things. And that's all I can see. I can't see any other way of getting a meaning out of 153. What? 153 fish. <laughs> Why 150? There must be a, a, a meaning behind this. And that's what I would see in this. The net and the fishes, all related to the 153. And the net is bursting full of fish, right? This is the great blessing of fullness that comes through the Lord, okay, in His ministry. So coming back now, let's go back to the sign, okay? And uh, I'm just pointing out the fact that there, there's, this, there's two endings and why there is this extra ending. And if we now look at the, um, the actual sign itself, so let, let's read it. This is uh, John 21, verse 2. There were together Simon Peter and Thomas, called Didymus, and Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, the two other of his disciples. Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a-fishing. Now, there have been a lot of commentators that, that say things like, well, he's impetuous, you know, he doesn't want to know what else to do, so all he knows to do is go fishing. So he says, let's go fishing. Well, a lot of that's injected into this. The Bible doesn't say why he did this, but he does, okay? He goes off fishing. They say unto him, we also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately, and that night that they caught nothing, Okay. Oh, man, have you gone fishing and catch nothing? It's a very disappointing thing, man. On the contrary, when you start to catch things, oh, man, and they don't stop biting, oh, man, that's an experience. That's experience. Reuben and I, I probably told you this once before, Reuben and I and a, and a third guy, we went out in the evening off a place in New Zealand. It, it was shallow. It's absolutely shallow water. I mean, you, you went quite a distance out, and then you, you go to put out the anchor, and it goes, doop. <laughs> In other words, it's only about five, six, seven, eight feet. That's it. But believe it or not, we parked this boat over the top of a school of fish that must have been feeding on the bottom of the shellfish, you know. And we only had a limited amount of bait. We, we weren't very faithful there. We just set a little bit of bait. We just thought, oh, we'll just do a bit of fish and come back home. You could not even get your hook to the bottom, before it would be taken with the fish. Bang, bang, bang. It got so ridiculous, I didn't even bother baiting. Didn't bother baiting. Just the glisten on the hook, shiny hook. Huh, bang. They'd go for the hook. <laughs> and you'd be pulling up these fish, and I said to them, hey, we're going to have to stop. First of all, we're going to go way past the limit if we don't watch out. And furthermore, we only got a small boat. <laughs> That was an amazing thing, um, catching fish like that. But, but here, look at the interesting thing here. Um, it says on verse 4, strange how this thing's moving around. 
Okay. So it says in verse 4, But when the, the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. So, so he was on the shore. Then Jesus saith unto them, Children, have ye any meat? They answered him, No. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and you shall find. So what did they do? They followed the instructions. They cast, therefore, and they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Okay. The Lord, after his resurrection, what ha happens? He manifests himself. When he shows himself to them, there's this great manifestation. And when they follow the instructions, what happens? The net's full of fish. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fish's coat up unto him. And here we got an interesting little comment. For he was naked. And this is some guy, isn't it? Just don't worry about clothes, just go fishing. Fully naked. I suppose it's, you know, cooler that way. And did cast himself into the sea. <laughs> He's a pretty rugged guy, this Peter. And the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from land, but that, as it were, 200 cubits, dragging the net with fishes. As soon as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid thereon, and bread. Jesus saith unto them, Bring of the fishes which ye have now caught, Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land, full of great fishes, and hundred and fifty and three. And for all there were so many, yet was not the net broken. Well, that's interesting, right? It's nigh unto breaking, but didn't break. Jesus said unto them, Come and dine. And none of his disciples did ask him, Who art thou, knowing that it was the Lord? Ah, at the beginning they didn't seem to recognize him. But now with his glory manifested and his work and their belief and their instructions, the instructions of the Lord being fulfilled. No more questions, man. Belief. Belief, man. And with this blessing, Jesus then cometh and taketh bread and giveth him and fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after that he was risen from the dead. Okay, so there is this very clear fulfillment of this uh, picture of Jesus, the one who brings things about, and that belief in him brings this fullness. And if you look at the, the structure of this between the, 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 the water turned into wine, which is the first sign, the marriage in Cana, versus the draft of fishes, you'll see this beautiful progression now, the main thing, thing that you see in the progression is Nathaniel and Thomas. Now, look how it goes. Just as you see a progression in belief, and you see a progression in the act of Jesus Christ in terms of his resurrection and the miracle that he did, so you'll see this in the confessors. If you go back to John 1, just look at this with me. John 1 and verse <coughs> 43. It says this, The day following Jesus would go forth into Galilee and findeth Philip and saith unto him, Follow me. It's Galilee, right? It's interesting because Galilee is also known in Matthew as Galilee of the Gentiles. And remember, John's ministry is about the world. Now, Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And then and Nathanael saith unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? <laughs> you see, a, an expression of unbelief here. Philip saith unto him, Come and see. Come and have a look, man. Can anything good come out of Oklahoma? Come and see, man. Come and see. Hey, you know, if you look what's going on in the country, it's very interesting, isn't it? If you look at how the movements within the country... We're seeing a lot of people from the coast coming into the south, including Oklahoma. 
you know. They're coming from New York and all sorts of places. Because why? Because a whole lot of bad stuff is going on with the economy in these, these states. Oklahoma, Texas, they're looking to be pretty good states to go to because they run better. It says this in verse 47, Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and saith to him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom is no guile. That's right. Nathanael saith unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Nathanael answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God. Thou art the King of Israel. See, unlike Israel, Israel had plenty of guile. Right? But Nathanael now, after seeing this tremendous truth and prophecy that Jesus brought forward, he believes. He becomes strong and he makes this confession, Son of God. Now, if you go across to John 20, look at the other confessor. Okay? The, these are parallel signs. And what you see is a progression. You're coming out of this part of John's Gospel, the seven signs, and then you come into the eighth sign, which is associated with a brand new beginning. And now you're going to see the fruits of the Lord Jesus Christ and His ascended glory He's showing himself in his glory and demonstrating his power. Okay, cool. John 20, 25, leading up into this eighth sign. Uh, let's see, we'll read from, let's see, we'll read from uh, verse 24. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. This whole business of how Jesus came is interesting. Coming through into the room when the doors are shut and he comes through and then it says the other disciples therefore said unto him we have seen the Lord but he said unto them except I shall see in the, his hands all all statement of unbelief I need proof right the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and thrust my hand on his side I will not believe I want proof I want proof. Now look at this, verse 26. After and after eight days. Oh, wait a minute. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Complete. Eight. New beginning. New beginning. Pointing you straight into the events of the eighth sign and everything else. And after eight days, again, his disciples were with him, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the door, doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. Now look what Thomas says now. Remember Nathaniel, the son of God, the king of Israel. Yeah, he was brought along, right? And that's, that's, that's a fantastic statement, the Son of God. That's, that's coming a long way. But look how far Thomas now comes. And Thomas, verse 28, answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God, the God of me. Very, very strong statement now. And so then you lead into chapter 21 and that, Eighth sign. Well, I think you can see a progression here. So you get the first sign, which has to do with the water pots. They were, you know, they needed to be filled up and they were filled to the brim, it says. Right? The provision of the Messiah is shown there. But what when you get to the eighth sign, you get to the new beginning, and Jesus now is manifesting himself, and now you see the power of his might, the glory, the fact that he is God in the flesh, all demonstrated clearly. Now this is where I just want to leave with this. So when you look at the sign, all right, and Bullinger has a great sort of summary of this. When Messiah gives joy to the nation, it will be filled up to the brim. And we see that in the you see that in the water pots, you see that in the prophecy of Isaiah 9, 2 to 7. And John 21, 11. And when he fills the land with restored Israel in resurrection, it will be to the last one. That's Nicodemus, right? 
How can a man be born again? Ye must be born again. Yes, Jesus now showing himself, manifesting himself, the first fruits of them which sleep, showing you again the shepherd, the apostle and the prophet and shepherd. For in the eighth sign, Messiah was the caller, signifying that he will be the gatherer. What is that passage there, Jeremiah 31, 10? He that scattered Israel shall gather it. Again, all of these things are being brought together in this last particular sign. Now, I'm out of time now, but what we're going to do next time is I'm going to bring up in more detail this business of how it was that Jesus made himself manifest and go once more, this time, in even deeper detail into those three things, right? The questioning of Peter. Why did it happen? What was the nature of the verb that's used here for love? Because it's really interesting. I'll go through these, right? Go through these in detail. And I've always sort of anticipated it with you, looking at the denials, the nature of the denials, where it happened at the door, right, by the damsel. The damsel sort of just slipping this little question in as he goes by. And then you get the second and third denials. They come in rapid succession, one after the other, right? And we will look at these in some detail and answer a lot more concerning this. So next time, what's in store next time? In store next time, what I want to do is I want to make a summary of what I have learned about John's Gospel, the signs, and what's going on today. And I think it will be a, a worthwhile lesson for, for us all. Okay, let us pray. Our God and Father, we thank Thee for this time that we've had together. And uh, Lord, the meat of the Word is here, Lord. We have to ponder it, and we have to go over it and over it and understand how it all interconnects. And the fact that we today... Uh, are so fortunate in that we have been revealed the, the mystery which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men as it is now revealed. We thank thee, Lord, for that revelation. We pray for the country, Lord, that as we uh, see uh, people who are mixed up and need to understand the, the issues of the day, we, we ask for wisdom to speak to them. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.